I, I mentioned that we would pray for some of our fellow body members that need just God's moving in their lives. I know Michelle had asked for prayer this morning as she wasn't feeling well. I know his sister is still in his 12 weeks of recovery here. So, um, you know, let's speak healing. And, and what about others? You know, I don't, I don't know. Maybe you got some folks real quick that you want to include in that. But anyone? You got some friends or fellow members here at the body you know need? We appreciate our prayer at this time. Uh, pray for Jonathan. He was his birthday yesterday. Yeah. And you know, he seems to be doing good. Yeah. I know he's, he's uh, he, he mentioned he was he's still um, indecisive about where he wants to live. So I think he's, He seems to be uh, happy in Boulder, Colorado. He says he's yeah. a nice place. <laughs> he is, but he also, uh, he misses oh, his yeah. wife, so. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that's true. that uh, he says, I don't know. I don't really want to go that direction, but think I want to go that direction, <laughs> so it's a little funny, but uh, let's pray for them, and uh, Father God, we just speak healing right now, yes, yes, no, Cicero, yeah, Nelson. it's getting better, a lot better, good, Cicero or Nelson or both, yeah, no, yeah, I'm saying Cicero is uh, getting a lot better, oh, good. good, you know, he's um, really, he has good spirits all the time, and he yes. like, he goes, uh, he says he crawls around the house, you know. <laughs> and, and Nelson is okay, you know, he's uh, doing good too. He needs some prayer too. Yeah, oh, no, I think when Lewis meant crawl, it's not like on all fours. He has a wheelchair and he just kind of uses his whatever to get around, right? He's still in the wheelchair. Yeah, but he goes down the stairs. He's not going to go down the stairs in the. <laughs> yeah, and that's why he said he, 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 he crawls so like a cat. You know? Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. Well, coming from the occupational therapist, I'm sure you <laughs> teach people how to get around whatever way they can. But um, if we could pray for the phase two, they're trying to sell their land, and yeah. they have a wonderful offer on the table, but it's just been lingering. So, um, so if we could just pray for that. Sure. Anyone else? First of all, we speak healing right now in the name of the Lord Jesus to the people of our body that need uh, a healing touch. We speak strength to their physical bodies. And whatever else is they're, they're in need of, like Cicero, we're mending of those areas of, of previous harm. Everything that he needs, God, just me, we speak that right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for knitting it all back together, putting it better than it was, and giving him the ability to get back into the, the workplace and into the marketplace. In the name of the Lord Jesus, pray for the phase, God, that you would just open up opportunities for them and uh, solidify any plans that are, are initiated by you but deterred by the enemy or the flesh. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we bind the enemy from every involvement that he has in the minds of those who have who have already been moved by God to get involved with them and their needs. And uh, thank you, God, that it happens on both sides. It happens on the foreign side and the state side. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And God, others who we know need your touch, or maybe they're just, this morning we're missing them, and we want you to, to minister to them. And we want them to know that we just miss them, and that right now, in our absence that they would feel your presence as we are here and just experience a touch by you and we thank you God that you'll really make that connection it's between we all share a common bond in your presence right now in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Amen Amen pray for your kids Amen. praise the Lord those of, you, of those of you and those of us who have kids pray for them in the name of the Lord Jesus that uh, they be free and fruitful. Amen? Mm -hmm. Free and fruitful. All right. Um, how many of you just want to kind of look into God's Word today, see what it uh, see what it might share with us, some good things going forward? Uh, we're in the book of Mark uh, still, and <laughs> we're in the six chapters, and we're making progress. All right, Matthew 6. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was looking at Matthew and said that because of it. But yes, we're in Mark 6. 
And uh, some of this stuff starts out here in uh, Jesus going back to his hometown. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, unbelief. We're going to talk about faith. We're going to talk about uh, some of the things going on here. But I'd like to start out, uh, here he goes into the synagogue. In the first couple of verses here, he goes into the synagogue. And they were astonished. And they start asking questions among themselves. Where did this man get all these things from? Where did he get this wisdom from? Uh, and how does he perform these works? So they've got some, uh, some uh, information about him and his ministry prior to arriving there. And then they, they go right into verse 3, and it says, um, Is this not the carpenter, uh, the son of Mary, the brother and brother of James, Josie, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And so they were offended in him. Now, um, just, just so we're all on the same page about some of the facts here, obviously this gives us some insight that a few other areas do about the life of Jesus. You know, when we think of him growing up, we probably don't think of him as a whole family unit. We more think of him and Mary and Joseph, you know, because that's how it started out. But uh, in the end, we see here that he's got at least four brothers. Well, he's got four brothers and at least two sisters. So that's already a six-member family, bless him. So that's, a, a, you know, it's sizable. And we can't even say there were more, just two. There was probably more because they, they did well with sons. I wouldn't see why they do well with, wouldn't do well with daughters. So I'm presuming it was a large, large clan. But uh, just again, so we kind of got it all in perspective when it says, uh, it says his brother's names are uh, James, Josie, Judas, and Simon. Uh, the names more commonly used for those might have been uh, James, Joseph, Jude, and Simon. With that in mind, uh, a lot of the books that you um, uh, might associate with that are indeed uh, attributed towards these men, the brothers of Jesus, in the case of the book of Jude and in the case of the book of James. Both of those being the Lord's brother by natural descent but obviously not qualified because of that, but because of new birth. Mm -hmm. they, they recognized him as their savior, not just their brother, half-brother, you know, but rather as savior. And they wrote those books and were attributed to family members as well as um, authors of those books. So um, verses 5 and 6, actually, uh, I skipped 4. Jesus said that a prophet is not without honor except in his own country among his own relatives and his own house. How many of you have experienced that? I mean, it's like when you get saved, your family thinks you're the same person that you always were, and then they're like, well, you went bananas, you know, there's something wrong with you. And the reality is that you're a new creature, just like we said this morning. You're no longer the person you were. You are a new creature. And sometimes it's hard for your family to wrap their head around the spiritual change that has taken place in your life. And likewise, you know, we often forget that our children are, are capable of becoming wholly different than, than when we knew them as our children. And I'm personally pretty excited about that prospect, you know, about even if you raise a child right and in the ways of the kingdom of God, when they own it, it becomes something entirely different. And it's, a, it's an amazing transformation to watch. And that only God does that. You know? And quite frankly, it's, it's my prayer, not just for our kids, but to see that kind of transformation. Because I, I, you know, I get kind of tired of just walking people through the natural steps of, of trying to reason with them why Jesus is superior to all of the religions or all other things. You know? But then when, they, when it's a supernatural connection, then it's like you're not trying to force the change on them. You're actually just able to sit back and say, wow, this is a supernatural thing. It's so awesome to watch. So that's really my heart when it comes to sharing Christ. Is, you know, I share him in every opportunity I get, but I, but I really enjoy the opportunities where somebody has taken hold of it for themselves. And instead of you're trying to force feed the child, they are hungry. They want to come and they want to nurse, as it were. They're there. They're ravenous and they're they want to be fed. You know, that's the kind of awesomeness that a personal relationship with Christ, that new birth. Uh, you know, the name says it all. New birth. It creates a ravenous desire for God inside of us. Amen. 
And I, I just long for that kind of conversion, if you will. You know, not just to try and walk people through this step by step here. I'm going to cram this, you know, power of the gospel. We're going to sit down. We're going to have Bible studies. We're going to, you know, all this stuff. When in reality, when it's new birth, it's just a ravenous desire from within to know God better and to feast on Him and to find every outlet you can to absorb more of that. And that's that's just my personal prayer that I would I would be a part of that kind of movement. Amen. You know, I don't I understand all the you know, not everybody's there, but I just don't think I gotta limit myself to that kind of an experience. I want to be a part of that kind of a revival in the hearts of even just one by one by one. It doesn't matter to me. The idea is I want to be a part of people who are pulling it out of me. Amen. Not just, you know, not just I'm fortunate mom, you know, but I'm, I, I want to be there for them to just pull it out of me. And it, it makes us rise up too because then when, when, we're, when we're the ones being pulled upon, we realize our source, we need to get back in connection and keep connected to that source in order to be able to be a means of encouragement to others. Amen? So make that your prayer too, if you will. Be bold, be like me, and just say, you know, I just want to be a part of a people who are ravenous. All right, um, so Jesus talks about a prophet, and there, just so we all, you know, got what he said here, I mean, he calls himself a prophet by saying this. So when, you know, it doesn't mean that he is exclusively a prophet, that he's operating as a prophet as well as the Son of God. So um, when people ask, especially other religions, you know, they consider him a prophet, you say, yeah, he was a prophet and so much more. Amen? Amen. The prophet was the, the bottom of the barrel calling. On the <laughs> you know, he's, he's so much more. Amen? Amen. All right, so it, among your relatives and among your own house, among your own country, you know, you might not be able to see the kind of, of correlation between who you are in Christ and who you were the way they knew you. And it, it, after a while, then the realization comes in, just the, the reason I said that, you saw the James and Jude, you know, it didn't hit them. But after new birth, it hit them. And the realization sunk in, they became church leaders. So if you stick with people that don't necessarily understand the change that's taken place in your life, stick with it, stick with them, because after a while, they'll become the James and the Jude in your life. Yeah. You know, they'll take what you what you've displayed, what you've given, and they'll make something more of it. So, praise God for that. All right. Um, so it says there that he could there do no mighty work except lay his hands on a few sick people and he healed them. Now, I want to camp out on that for a minute to understand a little bit more about that because there's there's the idea that that God is limited by our faith I want you to understand that statement, though, that God is never limited, per se. In other words, if you were to draw a line between all God is and has and all man needs, and you were to say, okay, down this middle of the line, all that's over on this side, the God side of it, is, is uh, unlimited, it is uh, unrestrained, it is complete. But on this side of things, we don't get to experience all that's over on this other side unless we have faith. Okay, that is how, in other words, God's not limited by anything or anyone. But the amount we receive from God is limited by us. And that's important to understand because I'm not here to tell you, you know, that Jesus was limited by their unbelief. I'm telling you Jesus was capable and able but they limited what they would receive by what they believe. Amen? Mm -hmm. Unbelief limits God's, in other words, what you receive from God, not necessarily limits God. He's still God. He's always going to be 100% God. Um, so, we actually see that uh, before the baptism that he was baptized with by John, there was no real evidence of power, no mighty works done in his life. And you remember that it says, you know, in Cana of Galilee, this first miracle was when he turned the water into wine. So that was the first noted miracle in the Bible. 
So with that, we would have to understand that these people only knew him as the carpenter, the son of Mary and Joseph, had not seen any kind of miraculous works throughout the time prior to this. They had heard that after he was baptized by John, that things started to happen in his life, but they couldn't get over uh, the person they knew. And in this case, <clears throat> we would have to say that they've seen nothing for so long that they just believed for nothing. In other words, just at age approximately 30-ish, we'll say Jesus is about 30 at this age. So for 30 years, they've seen come and go. They've seen Jesus come and go through their lives and seen nothing. And sometimes after being a Christian for 30 years, you've come to see so little that you can believe for so little. <laughs> and it becomes the norm. You just believe for so little. And I don't necessarily want to be in that place where just because everything that you uh, have seen for this last 30 years seems to be diminishing in, in experience, that that means that that's, that's the new standard going forward. You know, I'm here to ch challenge you that there's no precedence for the fact that because you've not seen what you want to see up to this time, that you can't still see it going forward. Are you hearing me? Yes. That just, it, 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 is, it is not God to keep believing for nothing just because you haven't seen much up to this point. You just start today remembering that Jesus has now put you in a place where he's opened up all the opportunities for you. Let me read for you Ephesians because I want you to see the difference between uh, the way we think about Jesus today and the way he is today. If you could just listen for a moment while I read this, it says in Ephesians 3.20, it says, Now to him that is able, everybody say able. able. Okay, that's a pretty big word. In other words, uh, if I could move a, a ton with my bare hands, I would be able to move just about anything. Isn't that right? Ability is, is, is a big it, it encompasses everything that God can do. And it says, to him that is able to do, now this version put it this way, indefinitely more than all we could ask or imagine. That means if I've read it in the scriptures, can you listen now? That means if I've read it in the scriptures, I can imagine it. Right? And most of us don't imagine as much as we see here in the scriptures. But it doesn't just say you could have what the Bible says. It literally says, if you're able to imagine it, now where do you come up with the things that you imagine? Well, most of the time because of somebody else's experiences or so forth. You imagine things. I imagine that could be as awesome for me as it was for them. But here he says in Ephesians, now to him that is able, again, able to do indefinitely more than we ask or imagine. Okay, that's why Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also and greater. Because you're not supposed to just say, everything that Jesus did I can do, you could actually say even more. I mean, that's mind-blowing, and that's where faith comes in, is to be able to, to say, that if I serve a God who is able to do more than I can even imagine, then everything that I see here I can imagine, I can comprehend. But he says he is able to do even more than I can able to, I'm sorry, more than I can imagine or even comprehend. So with that in mind, I think the the, the potential is limitless. For, so we don't have a place where we can stop, where we can rest, where we can find refuge for our unbelief. There is no place for that. And I, the reason that I say there's no place for it, and I'm not trying to be mean, I, uh, if we're going to read the book, let's read the book. Hmm. All right? So let's, if, let me finish the verse, and then we'll continue reading what Mark says here. He says, he's able to do indefinitely more. Again, that word able, in other words, it's not on God the power, 
all of the resources. All that is not limited by God. Now to him that is able to do, ex or, I'm sorry, I was going to quote, exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think, but I just like indefinitely more <laughs> than we could ask or imagine according to the power that is at work in us. So we know that that's God in us that causes us to be able to exceed our own imaginations. Glory. Remember we talked about Glory. His presence changes us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a reality. Mm -hmm. There's no other way for us to get beyond the barrier of our own thoughts and imaginations except that His power in us causes us to expand beyond our own comprehension of His possibilities and His abilities. Amen? Amen. Amen. So He says... Um, so on the one side, we see all of God's ability and desire. But God's ability is limitless, but our ability to receive is limited by unbelief. And I know this sounds so weird, but to, to imagine that we could actually believe for something with no other foundation other than the fact that God is immeasurably able to do every more than we could ask or think. I mean... Because it immediately, when you think of believing for something, you think, well, uh, here's all the reasons that can't be. Or here's, here's all the obstacles. And you're like, but it's, it, it's amazing that believing is putting all that aside and in spite of it saying, God, you're able to move more than I could imagine. More than I could think. And I've got a lot of imagining already here. You know? But then putting that out there, let me let me just continue to read here. I said, I threatened we'd go ahead and keep reading, so let's do that. <laughs> um, in verse six, 6, it says here, and he marveled because of their unbelief. I, 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 I mean, I took that, and I read that, and I thought, in other words, I, I looked it up in the Greek just to be sure I, I kind of got the full effect on it. And, and in the Greek, it said, it said, amazed. I thought, what does it take to amaze God? I mean, we've got this God who is, uh, who is able to do everything, and yet it says here that something amazed him. Something was amazing to God, so I thought, what is it? And he said he was amazed at their unbelief. Now, this isn't the kind of amazing like, wow, that's great. This is an amazing like, how can you even be this way? <laughs> It's amazing to me. <laughs> Amen? That's the kind of amazing that we're talking about, is to, to think that, that God, who, who looks at everything from his perspective as, it's either a done deal and it's provision for us, or it's something I'm able to manufacture for you as needed. And we serve this God, and it amazes him that we can't see beyond this veil of the natural. And it amazes him. And not in a bad way, it's just, you got to understand his perspective. He did not have any of that present in his being to even understand or comprehend why we don't connect the dots between this immeasurably capable God and the basic needs that we have in life. And it sounds like Healing uh, is, is not just a basic need. It's, it's like a special thing. But, but God doesn't look at it that way. It's, it's just the basic needs of life. How are you going to proclaim a kingdom without some evidence of it? So that part of the evidence is there's healing. There's power over demons. There's influence that, that's being exerted from this unseen kingdom into the seen realm. And it, 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 it quite frankly, I think the word that, that, that I used in my notes... Uh, was was kind of good for this, but it, it shocked him. It's just shocking from his perspective to think about all the potential that was awaiting them and the littlest thing of he was born among us and we see his family members, we see his, his brothers and his sister. Where else did he, where, where did he get all this from? And you're like, shouldn't that be the answer to your question? He got it from a supernatural source. You should be rejoicing. 
there's this guy that you grew up with, was a nice guy, but he was nothing yeah. like he is now. And so you should be able to say, okay, well, if this guy is nothing like he was when we knew him for the last 30 years, that's some evidence that he's got somebody in his corner. We need to listen to this guy. We need to put our believing out there. We need to put some faith into this thing. And instead, they do exactly the opposite. They say, we've known him for 30 years. I don't know what he's doing or where he's going. There's obviously something going on, but I just can't see it. And he marveled. He marveled because it was just so evident right before them. I'm not the guy I was. I mean, I'm the same guy, but I'm better. I've now been empowered by the Spirit of God. I couldn't see it. Amen? Amen. All right. I looked at verses uh, 7 through 13. It says, He called the twelve unto himself, and he sent them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits, and he commanded them to take nothing on the journey except a staff and a bag, no bread, no copper, no money in their belts, and to wear sandals and put on two tunics, and not to put on two tunics. I'm like, I don't know about you, but I kind of got a picture of this. Let me just see if I got the right picture. See if. See if the picture that you got in your mind is the same as mine. There's two guys. They go out by pairs, and all they've got is a staff. Right? Let me make sure I got that right. This is the one where he says, no staff. Let me see. All right. So he commanded them to take nothing on their journey except a staff. Okay, so they got a staff. Right? No bags, no bread, no copper in their money belts. All right? And they shouldn't bring two coats, just one. All right? So if you've got this picture with me, you know, they don't have anything. Nothing. Now, what's most amazing about this? I thought I'd ask myself why. And the first question I thought is, you know, there are so many things in life we think we need in order to be where we want to be. Wow. In order to, to be in the place where God wants us and where, where we're usable by God, we're, we're good material for Him. We think we, we got all this stuff. And the funny thing is, is I don't want to say that God wants to strip us down to the bare necessities in order for us to actually be usable, but I am saying this. There is something to be said for what happened here. Now, I'll give you my slant on it, and I can't be sure it's 100% accurate. But I can tell you this. The picture is two people go out with absolutely nothing. And then, he says, and whatever place, whatever place that you enter in the house, uh, stay there till you depart from that place. In other words, you get, you know, whatever... Whoever opens their door to you, just keep that as your base of operations for the time that you're there. Don't go, you know, spending the night everywhere else. Don't waste the time. Just, just dedicate your time to the purpose instead of your pleasures. You know? And that's really hard work to hear, but I mean, you know, if you get to stay in a dump because that's the first place they open their door for you, just think how wonderful that is. Hey, I get down. I get to stay in a dump. Awesome. I'll be here for the next two weeks. Can't. I look forward to coming home every night. You know? But... The point was is that you're not there for your pleasures. You're there for your purpose, right? And wouldn't that be great? We could just remember that throughout life. Not here for our pleasures. You're here for the purpose. And it's going to be good preaching no matter how many times you say it, no matter what, where you are in life. I mean, it's just going to be that way. And we're all guilty of, of, of enjoying the pleasures more than the purpose. But it's just a checkup, you know? That's what, what was partially going on here. But even better is this, all right? When you think about this, there's two guys that don't have anything. They go into whatever place opens the door for them, and they've got to stay there. And you think, why? Well, we said, well, it's, it's primarily about the purpose and not your pleasure. Is that right? But at the same time, think about people. Think about people. When, when you come in to a situation where you have been a humble person, okay? And there is really no other humble place than when you don't have any money, 
You don't have any, even have anything but the change of clothes on your back. You've got no plan B. It's not just like you're trusting God. You're literally trusting God through people. Because those people have food, which they don't have any of. They have money, which they don't have any of. They have a place to stay, which they don't have any of. Do you hear what I'm saying here? Is that when you don't have anything, you are also in need of mercy by the very people who need what you have to give them. It puts you in a whole different dynamic. You're not above them. You're not better than them. You're, you need their mercy as much as they need yours. And that's illustrated for us of what happens next. Because he says here, and whoever will uh, will not receive your, I'm sorry, will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from that place, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. I mean, sometimes you wonder what. What's Jesus thinking when he says this stuff? And how, to, you know, and it starts to play in your mind. Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, you remember the story about, uh, you know, fire and brimstone coming down on those two cities to demolish them for their, their sinful behavior. And Lot's wife who turned back and turned to the pillar of salt and all that stuff. And you're thinking, okay, these people are in a worse situation if they reject the message that these people are bringing. Because they've come in there with an attitude of humility. They have nothing. But the only one thing they have is a mandate from God to share the message about Jesus, about the kingdom of God. So they come in there with nothing as humble people. In other words, their attitude is right. They've got to have the right attitude because they don't have anything else. Amen? Right. And that's very important because the attitude with which you approach somebody if you come in with an attitude of humility, like the scriptures talk about restoration between body members, those people in the body of Christ, fellow believers, talks about approaching them in a spirit of meekness. Well, much more, likewise, that works in all ways. When you come in needing the mercy of somebody else, and them seeing that, the whole dynamic between your relationship has changed. You're not trying to force a situation, you're not trying to make somebody understand your perspective, you're not trying to win an argument. You're poor, you don't have anything, and you would like a place to stay and some food. You've put yourself at the bottom. Now you're sharing in that position, you're sharing a message that can benefit them. But because they respond to you in mercy, then you can respond to them by giving them the message of mercy from God to them. So that mercy is going both ways in this thing. And it says here, Jesus gives this, this dynamic of how bad it will be for the people who reject these disciples' message because of the attitude with which they came. They came with nothing. And if you can't receive from a person who has nothing more to give you than the message, it's going to be heck to pay in the end. That's what he says. He says, look, when you... When people are brought this message in the kind of attitude that I'm preparing you to bring it in, it's going to be so much more worse for them than it was for the people that you think the worst has already happened to. I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah is a well-known story, not just among us, but especially among, you know, the people that were being addressed. And they were like, man, it was really bad for them people. They're like, yeah, well, it's going to be even worse for the people that you thought it was already bad for if you don't understand the dynamic between I'm coming, I'm bringing this message to you at the bare bottom. And if you can't hear it from these people who have emptied themselves of everything, just like Jesus who's emptied himself of everything, bring us this message. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you to empty yourself of everything so that you can bring a message that can literally be used by me to bring life or death to the people that it's brought to. So we may not be able to live like that every day. But I can tell you it's always something good to aim for, isn't it? No matter how much you have in your pocket, no matter how much you have wherewithal, no matter how many clothes you have in your closet. Anybody here only got one set of clothes? 
See, nobody, everybody's got more than one set of clothes here at least, right? And yeah. I'm, pre I'm pretty sure you know where your next meal is. You know? So everybody's got, everybody's got a better foundation than these guys had. And out of this place of need, they were sharing the gospel. And so that's why it was so much worse for the people that didn't hear it. Because you couldn't ask for a better vessel. And Jesus himself sent them out. He sent them out with the most humble of attitudes and in the most humble of circumstances. And if you can't hear the, <laughs> hear the gospel out of the people who have emptied themselves of everything, how much, how much judgment do you expect to wage? So lastly, I want to clean up with uh, where we're going this morning with, uh, with Herod and, uh, and his, his wife Herodias. I didn't do as much study on Herod otherwise, other than I know that there was a, there was a father and a son, Herod the Great and Herod Agrippa and everything, but I'm not going to bore you with all the details. But I can tell you this. Let's start in verse... Uh, oh, wait. I did want to say something in verse 12 I've got here. that <laughs> It says here that uh, they will not... Let's see. Uh, verse 12. Uh, and so they went out and preached that people should repent. I thought that was just wonderful. Can you imagine that counter counterculture message right now? It you know to bring a message that says repent is basically saying y'all are going in the wrong direction. You need to go in the opposite direction. <laughs> what a great message, right? But the idea is that you know they preached a counterculture message. In other words, Whatever, whatever they were doing, they were, if they were called to repent, it was go in that other direction. Change directions on this thing. And it's amazing that today we are afraid to say anything is wrong. Or anyone is wrong. Anyone or anything. That, because somehow uh, they, they, they've convinced us that there are no absolutes. And that uh, the God of love doesn't have absolutes. When the reality is, is that, yes, there are standards. Now, Jesus has met those every standards for us. But still, you have to realize those standards never changed. See, the, the culture is trying to change the standard. And I say the standard is always the same. It's never changed. It's, the wages of sin is death. You know, it, it's, That's not going to change, no matter how you slice it, dice it, and put it in an omelet. Nothing's going to change. But the reality is, is that Jesus has has taking care of the penalty. He has been the substitution. Amen. Yes. So that message is repent. In other words, turn away from that Christless life and accept Christ in place of your own punishment. It's a simple message. But we're so accustomed and, 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 and so infiltrated by the world that we can't seem to get that message out. There's, there's, there's got to be a God way to get the message out there without compromising the standards that God has set. All have sinned and come short of the glory of I'm a good person. I never said you weren't a good person. I just said all have sinned. Whether you recognize it, whether you believe it, whether you whether your subjective opinions about that are different than mine. I, the standard is, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And that grace is the only way for you to enter in to the kingdom of God. Not by works, lest any man should boast. Yeah. In other words, no matter if, if there was any hope that you could get in in any other way and you achieve that, then you would be a boastful person. You would proudly proclaim that. But there is no other way. And that the reality is there is no other way. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, not a way, right? Amen. But that message can't be lost among us. All right, lastly, a godly standard will stir the conscious in our absence. The reason I say that is because if you look uh, in verse 13, it says, and they cast out many demons, and they, laid, they uh, anointed people with oil, and, uh, and many were healed. That's 
that was the, the bottom line of the message that they brought. There was confirmation of it. Here in verse 14, though, I say uh, that a godly standard will stir the conscience in our absence. Because as we see here, John brought a godly standard up. And as he brought this godly standard up in, in verses, say, 14 through 16 or something, um, you know, here is, here is Herod, and he's, his conscience is bothering him because he's put to death a godly man. Now, I don't want you to think that that's the only way for you to have some kind of residual effect on somebody's life is you got to leave a word with them and then die for it. No, I'm saying that sometimes you leave a word with someone and you're no longer in their life. You're not in their circle anymore. But what happens is it continues to burrow in their conscience and causes them at whatever time that they have to reevaluate where they are with God, the words that you gave them, assuming they were words like, repent, assuming they were words that were counterculture. In this case, this word was counterculture. The, the King Herod wanted Herodias, his brother's wife, for his own, and John said, that's just not cool. Hmm. Now, Herod, he was, he was moved by that, and he didn't want to put John to death for saying something that he knew was true. Yeah. But his mistress, or wife, I guess, whichever, I don't know which way you want to call it. I'll call her mistress for the moment because of the fact that she really is another man's wife. So his mistress couldn't stand it. It just, it just ate her up that this man was not penalized for bringing a counterculture message right to her doorstep. So now here's the interesting thing. A lot of us think that this gentleman was brain dead. But I think that there might be more to it. So let's read it just real quick. And um, let's see. So now Herod heard of him, uh, speaking of Jesus, he heard of him. He, uh, for his, his name was well known, and he said, It's John the Baptist that has risen from the dead. Therefore, these are the powers that work in him. In other words, when you say something to somebody like John did, it's stuck in their life. And even when you're not around to, to be that influence, that word that you gave remains influential in their life. And he says, uh, others said it is Elijah, and others said it is that prophet, or it is one of the prophets. But Herod said, no, nope, it's John, who I beheaded. He has come from the dead. <laughs> in other words, he just can't get away from that word, you know, John's influence in his life. And he said, um, For Herod himself had sent and laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her again. He married her, but she was really somebody else's eye. So I'm not going to validate that marriage per se. I'm just going to leave it out there. But uh, said, uh, but John said, uh, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Because he brought that counterculture message when it was unpopular to do so. Therefore, Herodias held it all against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. Um, and when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Now, this is the part where you wonder what the heck went on. It says, uh, then an opportune day came, Herod, uh, when it was Herod's birthday, that he gave a feast, and all of his high officers and nobles and chief men from Galilee were there, and Herodias' daughter herself came and danced and pleased Herod uh, and those who sat with the king, and he said to the girl, ask me whatever you want, I'll give it to you, and he swore to her, whatever you ask, I will give up to you half my kingdom. Now again, for those of us with half a brain, we just don't understand that thing. You know, why on earth would you do something so stupid? He's drunk. Maybe, <laughs> maybe other other people think he was just you know caught up in the, uh, the, the erotica moment and but you know what? I, I got a little something better for you. <laughs> I've been in all them places in life and I haven't done anything that stupid. Uh, so I'm going to give you an idea. It's just something I'm going to throw out there. But Herodias has already got some pretty 
pretty strong influence over Herod. Strong enough that he would diss his brother and cause a lot of confusion and potential uh, uh, conflict, not just for he, but all, but, but people in the various sectors in which they ruled to be against one another. All for this lust that he has for her and she must have for him. So she's very influential in his life, quite obviously. So much so that I would gather to say that he's probably already made that promise to her in such a way as well. In other words, if you're my wife, you own half this anyway. So I think he was kind of playing it cool. I think he was like, I'm going to, you know, this is, everybody's out there saying, yeah, she's such a, she's such a great deal. How awesome is that? And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll tell you what, you can have anything up to half my kingdom. And in the side of his head, he's probably thinking, well, you know, your mother already owns that half. <laughs> so... It wasn't as much of a weird thing as you might think if she's already got pretty much the half and her daughter is dancing for him and he's like, well, you can have up to half. <laughs> it's half your mother already has. But the one thing she didn't have, she didn't have the right to execute John. So she used this opportunity when the girl came over, asked her mama, well, what should I ask? And I'm sure the mother's like, you know, we already got this. One thing I don't have, though, it's the only thing he's ever denied me. So I'm sure she had whatever she wanted, like nothing. So the only one thing I haven't been able to get out of him is I want that troublemaker John. I want his head. So, unfortunately, it says very clearly, let's read it real quick. He says here, he also swore to her, whatever you want, up to half my kingdom. He went out and he said to the mother, she went out and said to the mother, what shall I ask? And she said, ask for the head of John the Baptist immediately. She came in with haste, and the king asked, saying, what is it that you want from me? And she said, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist. Now, in verse 26, it says the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of his oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. In other words... He could refuse his wife in private. He done let the cat out of the bag now. And he was pretty sure that she wasn't going to, that anything she was going to ask for, he'd already given to his mother, her mother, and that was, that was, a, that was not going to be a problem. He just didn't think she was going to ask for John the Baptist's head. So unfortunately, he, it says, because of his oath's sake and because of the, he'd given it in front of all these people, he had to, he had to go through with it. So, yeah, maybe he was drunk. Maybe he was using poor judgment. I just think he was outfoxed. You know? I think he, I think he actually thought he had this. Not, they're not going to ask for anything. It's not already theirs. And the one thing they realized, we could still get out of the old guy. We could still get him to go back on John. So I'd like to leave it on a happy note, but that was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. But nonetheless, I think it helps us to understand uh, a little more about things. And again, that's just my take on it. You know, he could have been just a total whack job, and you know, and, but I think that he thought he was just being cool. He thought he had it all under control. Unfortunately, he negated the one, to pay attention to the one little detail that she had something, that, some one thing that she didn't have that she still wanted. Amen? But there's some good stuff in there. Chew on it for a while. See what God gives you. Maybe you'll come up with something even even better and more clear on some of those things. But it's something to think about, isn't it? Yes. All right, so uh, let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word today. Thank you, God, that we serve God who does immeasurably above all that we could ask or think according to the very power that's in us. In other words... I've been changed and I can believe for more than I could have ever believed for before. I've been changed and I can believe for things that would otherwise be impossible. Amen? Amen. How many of you are in that place with me? Amen. According to the power that works in us. In other words, I can literally believe for things that my mind can't comprehend. I can, be, I can believe for things beyond what, what I can understand or what I can imagine. 
Amen? Amen. Amen. Some of you got some really weird imaginations. But I tell you what, you know, we're talking about the sanctified ones. But, you know, there's some things that God's dumped in you and put in you. And, you know, and you're like, I just can't see it. I don't know how it's going to come about. And I, you know, I got no evidence for it. Well, congratulations, because today you are free. You are free to be able to believe beyond what you can comprehend. Amen? Amen. Today you are able to believe beyond what you can comprehend. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Because yeah. yeah. I know, you know, like Sebastian, you know, you see him sitting somewhere where that's not a good place for us and for him. You know? And you got so much better hopes for him and everything. But evidence says up to this date, everything we've seen going from behind leads us to believe it's going to be this way going forward. But you see, we can believe God for something more than we can even imagine. So can we see him praising God? Can we see him loving God? Can we see him submitted to God? Can we see him having children and grandchildren even that love God too? Can we see our kids having children and mates that are all on fire for God and all these things that they're only imaginations to us right now, but they're ones that we have the valid right to believe. Amen. Amen? Yes. Amen. All right, so Father God, we just believe right now in the name of Jesus in the face of facts that say otherwise because we believe that our God is able. Yes. That our God yes. is yes. able to do more than we can even imagine. So in the name of Jesus, we put our faith out there. We have no other expectations for, no other reason to believe for other than our God is able to do more than we can actually imagine. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right.